There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All, Back to the Innerverse, your podcast portal to the infinite potential present within. I'm your host, Guy Chance, and I'm glad as heck to be cohabitating in your headspace for another excellent episode. This recording is coming at you from November 16th, 2019, which you might remember as being smack dab in the middle of another Mercury retrograde. But despite the state of the space weather, all systems are go for an amazing transmission today. In fact, this episode is going to feel a lot like a continuation of some recent content we've covered here, in particular, the recognition, integration and healing of past traumas. And it seems quite appropriate to be looking at what's behind us to inform us about who we are now, since Mercury retrograde is a time that many astrologers say is all about internal retrospection. Figuring out just how the energy of our personal history is impacting our mind, body and spirit can be a slow and meandering path that never quite ends. But the quest reward for continually asking the question, who am I, is that we can morph our traumas and scars into our unique superpowers and help others feel permitted to do the same. The journey of self-discovery and expression may be a solitary path in the long run, but luckily there are some guides out there who share ideas to help us achieve the most improbable feats of healing and techniques for tuning into our infinite potential. Our guest today is one of those tremendous teachers, and as an author, meditation instructor, and chakra unlocker, she's here today to bring us up to speed on trauma and how it flavors our personal vibe. Her name is Lisa Erickson, and she's about to release a new book called Chakra Empowerment for Women, Self-Guided Techniques for Healing Trauma, Owning Your Power, and Finding Overall Wellness. As Lisa says in her book, chakras are intersections between our mind, body, and spirit. I love that definition, and to add what I've personally experienced, it seems that a good understanding of these vortex points can give you a sturdy mental scaffolding through which you can mold and strengthen your energetic body, which, once activated, becomes like an extra-dimensional vehicle for exploring inner space. So, although we'll be talking a lot about women-specific things today, the information belongs to both genders, because men need to upgrade their perception of women as much as women need to do that for themselves. And all of these interpersonal dynamics reflect through the fractal of nature throughout the entire cosmos because we all have an inner masculine and inner inner feminine. So yeah, it'll be good to know about, I bet. And before we get started, I want to let you know that there's an entire second hour to this interview available exclusively for Interverse Plus members. Support your favorite show and get twice as much of it by subscribing at patreon.com forward slash Interverse, which is also linked in the show notes. I forgo the obnoxious and time-consuming ads that many other podcasts use to fund their operations because I trust you guys out there to reciprocate some energy back to me if you find this show enjoyable. And by signing up, you'll get a huge archive of plus episodes available immediately. So it's a great way to spend $5 a month that you're essentially investing in yourself. Also in the show notes, you can find Lisa's blog, mommymystic.wordpress.com, chock full of empowering articles she's been writing for the last several years. And you can find her counseling services at enlightenedenergetics.com and pre-order her new book at chakraempowermentforwomen.com. Find all the links we talk about today in the show notes if you'd like to connect with Lisa and give her a shout on social to show some gratitude for her joining us today. I've barely even covered her certifications and creations, but the intro has got to cut off somewhere. So go ahead and get grounded if you're jittery. Practice a few conscious breaths and get ready to dial in to thrive with the energetic mystic who's unwounding women and transforming trauma all over the place, the Enlightener, Lisa Erickson. Thanks so much for being here, Lisa, and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you, Chance, for another excellent introduction. I was really looking forward to hearing what you were going to come up with for me. I think I like Chakra Unlocker the best there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that has a great rhythm to it. I was like, excited about that one. I was like, should I say it there? Should I save that for the big finish at the end? Uh, uh. But yeah, thank you. It was fun. It's fun to dial into someone like yourself and uh, get reminded that we're all energy bodies wrapped in meat suits. <laughs> and that's, that's right. Yeah. So why don't you start and just tell us how did you learn to tap into and manipulate that energetic body? Like what was your 
what was your kickoff point? I mean, looking back now, it was being born, right? Like as a, <laughs> as a child, <laughs> you know, no, I mean, I'm a Pisces. I have a lot of water. So ah, really, as a, okay. Yeah. So as a child, I just really sensed the world energetically, but I didn't know it. I didn't, didn't grow up in a situation where I necessarily was exposed to a lot of that. And I was really went into the mind. It was very intellectually oriented, very school oriented. And then in, but I was also a dancer. So there was this weird mix between the physical and being really cerebral. And then in college, I actually started having some health problems and I ended up in a meditation class that helped. And it was a chakra meditation class. And as soon as I was in, and this is, you know, I'm dating myself, but this is over 30 years ago. And, you know, as soon as I learned about the chakras and Kundalini for me, it was just confirming what I had been sensing my whole life. So then I studied with a teacher for many years, over a decade, that was very focused on chakra and kundalini meditation. And from there, I shifted into energy healing. And then from there, when I had children, I shifted into kind of the subtleties of women's energy bodies and what was going on there. And I moved into my own client practice. And a lot of the women that were coming to me had sexual trauma in their background. So then that became another focus. So it all just kind of evolved step by step by step. Very cool. And lucky you were to encounter a meditation class 30 years ago. It, you know, it's becoming more and more trendy, but your story kind of mirrors my own in the lowest point for myself, health wise and uh, consciousness wise, honestly, in the mid, like right in the middle of college, I was a, basically dropped out, but I was only enrolled in two courses. And one of them was a course on meditation and the other was a course on writing about your own personal spiritual journey of which I didn't even realize I had one. So it was just this weird uh, moment of getting picked back up off the ground by the universe and being like, okay, now you know what it feels like to be super sick. Here's the tools to start figuring out why you're sick. (laughs) And from there, it was just like all systems go. It's been a rocket ship since I learned meditation. So for me, I lost a lot of weight right away. But I wanted you to tell us what energy bodies do to influence our health, because I feel like that's a really important thing to realize is that body connection to all things spirit. Yeah, well, and there's a lot of different levels to the energy body and different teachings. So the meridian teachings, for example, that traditional Chinese medicine is based on an acupuncture and acupressure, that is really linked to flows in the body that go directly into the organs and all of that. And you've probably had guests that have talked about that as well. The chakras are more psycho-spiritual, so they have a lot more to do with the mind-body connection, emotional patterns, from my perspective, karmic obstructions, things that are coming even from past lives and all of this. And the way that those obstructions, that mind-body connection impacts our physical body. And so it's kind of like the chakras are this intersection point. Through them, you can work at the phys- on physical body health or they are also a pathway to awakening. And in terms of historical chakra teachings, there really are two different sets. There's the sets that were developed within the context of physical healing. And then there's the sets that were designed as a technology for spiritual awakening, for spiritual alignment, you know? And so I sort of started out in one and then ended up in the other. And now I've kind of brought them back together. So I think you can go either direction. Some people come in through the physical, some people come in through the spiritual. You can go either direction with the chakras because they're right there in the center. Man, that's really interesting. Well, I was going to say, so a lot of times when, so my work tends to be focused more on the emotional level. What emotional obstructions, emotional patterns are getting replayed in your life over and over and over and contributing to your suffering, to your pain, right? And I'm a Tibetan Buddhist in my own personal practice, so I tend to have a Buddhist perspective on that we're all naturally light. And so what is obstructing our ability to know ourselves is that in every moment. And we're working on those obstructions and bringing the light through. But often those emotional obstructions are coupled with health issues. And certainly when I look back now on my college experience and on health problems I had after my first daughter was born, they had an emotional and karmic component to them that manifested on the physical. And until I had the physical problem, I didn't pay attention to them. (laughs) So it was like my body was giving me this message of you've got to change some things in your life. Um, But the real root was not entirely physical, you know, so we had to work on both levels. Yeah, it's both and at the same time <laughs> to really make progress 
And I like to think of the chakras as if they're a big tube that is in your energetic field. And trauma could be like something that puts a kink in the hose, bends it up out of shape. And until you go back and actually restore the flow in that section, the pressure builds up and it causes damage to whatever region of the body is connected to that part of the tube, for lack of a better metaphor. But I I love uh, the dichotomy that you painted between accessing your knowing yourself as the light and all light and also the the body side and the meridian thing in Chinese medicine. I've always found that to be a really useful and interesting system and all everything related to that, like Qigong and Tai Chi has huge impact on on kinking that hose from the physical side. But when it happens, you end up actually having recollections and flashbacks sometimes in the middle of your, your practice, your session to sometimes stuff that you don't even recognize as traumatic. It just replays in your head and you're like, why did I replay that? Uh, Can you talk about that experience as far as, you know, stumbling into something you may have totally repressed about your own history? Yeah, I think it can play out a lot of different ways. I mean, sometimes I'll be working, you know, so a client, like they want to work on a relationship issue or something. And we're kind of just going into resentment. They're having, they're feeling towards their partner at the moment. And then they will we'll be focusing on that. I'll be asking them, where do you feel that in your body? Like when you're feeling that resentment, where do you feel it in your body? And really we're going into the subtle body. And all of a sudden they'll have a totally, what they think is a totally random memory of something some event in their childhood, something that occurred. And it may not even be something that qualified as trauma, but there's some sort of emotional that, or that they would on the outside qualify as trauma. But there's some sort of emotional link to what they're feeling now. And I think that's what you're speaking to when you talk about the subtle body. It, there's all these, our psyche makes all these connections or these data connections that aren't necessarily make sense to our rational mind. And so when you go into your subtle body, you're finding those connections. And when it comes to trauma, a lot of it is locked down. That is a survival mechanism. We compartmentalize. We put certain things away because our psyche cannot process them or integrate them at the time we're experiencing them. Then later on in our life, certain situations or things that we're going through are triggering some of those same feelings. And then it can come flooding back up or it might come in little snippets. Sometimes it's memories. Sometimes it's not even memories. It's just waves of triggers. Like all of a sudden you're triggered by certain mem- uh, smells or sounds and you never were before and you don't know why. And it's like that Pandora's box of whatever you had pushed down to survive when you were younger or even a pri- in a prior life, all of a sudden opens and starts to release all of that, all of that energy and all of those emotions. And then you have to, you know, then you have an opportunity, although it's very scary you have an opportunity to integrate them then once they've arisen. It's interesting to me personally that uh, this is the topic of conversation today, because just a couple weekends ago, I was hanging out with a friend who's a past guest on the show, actually does work similar to you. His name is Zane and he's a comic book writer. I recommend everyone go check out the episode with Zane Daniel, really cool episode. And while we were hanging out, he was doing some, uh, burn removal type energy work with us just pro bono really nice uh because we're ch- he he came to visit on, on a road trip and at a certain point he helped me make a connection to a certain memory a traumatic experience memory to tightness in my chest where before i never really thought about why my chest was frequently tight i thought it had to do with other just strictly physical reasons. And I always had kind of constriction there. And I had become aware of this trauma in my twenties that had happened to me when I was a lot younger and had repressed it through most of my like teenage years and still thought that like, well, I guess I've dealt with it. I, now that I know about it and I've accepted it and I'm, I'm okay, but still it kind of hung around and I wasn't re- figuring out why the, uh, the block it was still hanging around related to that thing. It was just kind of like a puzzle I couldn't figure out. And then when I made the connection that, oh, I'm holding on to this chest tightness because it reflects something in that scenario from the trauma. And as soon as I realized that the constriction lifted and then I felt this warm spinning energy rise up all the way up through my crown and head and uh, basically had like a, 
a psychedelic experience for like an hour. <laughs> it was so crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. Samadhi. It sounds like a Samadhi, which is when you have a new level of opening in the crown chakra, right? Like your heart chakra released. If something had been obstructing this energy in your heart chakra. It was solar plexus, really. But yeah, oh, I mean, there further, it was further down. OK, it was yeah. further. Down. Yeah. And then it just released all the way up and, and, and created this new opening in your crown to, to kind of experience a new a new uh, vibration and a new interdimensional plane. Yeah, <laughs> something yeah. like that. Well, that's how I see it. You know, that I, you know, we each, we each have our own frame of reference. So mine is always the chakras and Kundalini pads. And so that, but what you're describing is really like a classic experience that in Kundalini meditation paths, people actually seek out. They actually seek to bring the Kundalini energy up into their crown to trigger these Samadhi states. And that happens spontaneously when you release this obstruction. And I think that's, to me, it also speaks to the fact that the healing and the awakening path are really the same thing. <laughs> We're really yeah. always, you think you're on a healing path, you're on an awakening path, whether you think you are or not, it's all the same thing, you know? Or you try to be on an awakening path and you realize you can't get anywhere until you heal. <laughs> right. Or really that the whole awakening path is healing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cool though. Makes it, you know, makes it go faster. You get two things done at once. <laughs> yeah, but, exactly. Uh, so let's talk about some of the differences between men and women's energy bodies, because like, or maybe even give us some more anatomy of the energy body itself to start off, because I think these are dynamics that I haven't gone so in depth on in the show really before. And I never really thought about much of the difference between the male and female energy bodies before. I thought that we were kind of the same on that level, but there's, you know, gender in all things is one of the law, natural laws. So the energy body too makes sense. Yeah. And I think really a useful way to think of the chakras is that there are levels to them. And at the innermost core, they're pure light, pure source, whatever word you like to use. And that's ungendered, right? Or that's pre-gendered, however you want to think about it. But then at the level that connects, and there's a level that connects with our psyche, and there's a level that connects with our body. And at the level of the body, we are gendered. Of course, we realize that's very fluid now. There's really, it's not so uh, black and white, yin and yang, male and female. There's, there's a, it's a spectrum, really, um, both physically, emotionally, and energetically. But if we're speaking in terms of that spectrum, there are differences at the chakra level. And in especially how they connect to our physical body. And if you think about it, I don't know what the... Um, statistic what level what is it 90 percent of the human body it's the same for men and women right but then we've got this 10 percent that is pretty different right <laughs> and uh it's kind of the same and maybe it's not 10 percent. i don't know if it's 80 20 or whatever it is so you kind of have this this difference and i'll talk about that but i think there's another it's another thing i like to say which is that when you're studying physical anatomy we say the stomach is here the liver is here the spleen is here the lungs are here but in fact, if you were to dissect, you know, 10 different human bodies, none of them are exactly the same. There's slight variations in the positions of the anatomy for all of them. So I encourage people to think about chakra mappings, meridian mappings, all of these energy mappings in much the same way. They're a framework, they're a general map, but at the individual level, there are always variations and subtleties, and you have to kind of tune into those for yourself in your own subtle body. Yeah, so getting into the male female. So it, if there's a lot here, but the main difference is that for the most part, female subtle body is hooked into the pelvic chakra, which in different systems is numbered differently. But let's say we're going with kind of the seven chakra system that many people in the West are familiar with. It's usually considered the second chakra down in the pelvis, down between the hip bones. A man's subtle body tends to be rooted in the root chakra linked to the tailbone, the lower torso, the feet, and a woman's subtle body tends to be anchored in the second chakra closer to the womb. And that creates a lot of different differences, a lot of differences in the energy body. One of which is that a woman's subtle body waxes and wanes with her cycle. It waxes and wanes with her stages of life, right? Because a woman has pre, a premenstrual phase until she's 13 or 14, right? And then from then until 50 or so, she's menstruating monthly, except when she's pregnant. It changes again when she's pregnant. And then para, uh, paramenopause when it's irregular. And finally, menopause where there's no longer a cycle. In each of those phases, just like there's changes in the physical body for women, there is changes in her 
subtle body related to her second chakra opening and closing and being in different states. So I'll pause there for a moment and then (laughs) we'll go from there. (laughs) Yeah, I'm really interested about the certain phases of life where particular chakras become weak or vulnerable or maybe stronger or more dominant. And I know maybe like in childhood, for example, you go through a sort of a phase for each chakra in the first seven years of your life. Is there a consistent pattern like that throughout the next seven year phases that someone continues to go through? Or, you know, what's that kind of look like? Well, you know, in terms of stages of development, there's a couple different models. One is that model that one chakra kind of awakens each of those first seven years of life. And another is that every seven years you cycle through a different chakra in terms of life lessons so that the entire first seven years of life is really about physical body. And then you're moving into emotional body going in from seven to to 14. And then like that, it's not exactly seven. It's more like seven and a half because it's meant to tie to the Saturn cycle of 29 years. So when you've done, when you get to your Saturn return at 29, you've been through it. You've been through four chakras. You're at the heart chakra. Um, so there's all these different mappings, really, that are used. And I think they're all helpful. You can kind of layer them one on top of the other. And they're all relevant to both men and women. But for women, and I should say that men also have cycles. There's just less pronounced. And I think it's very important for there to be more information on male cycles. Yeah, that's a rare topic. Yeah, I would like my next book to be for men. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what I find really interesting is the astrology connection, because just like with medical science, it doesn't work to say, OK, here's the model for all humans. This is what works because it doesn't. Yeah. But the but the scaffolding, the mental scaffolding of that, there is a pattern there and it's going to resemble something like this with, you know, variations on the theme astrology lets you see some of your personal differences and if you get well versed in how astrologies connect to the energetic body and the planetary connection to chakras it's interesting because we're talking about you know going through the cyclical repeating pattern phases of chakra development and in the same at the same time the planets that are supposed to represent that in the occult sciences are actually mirroring that phase pattern, that w- like waveform. No, it's really cool because it really is that inner and outer mirroring each other, right? And that there are these layers, like these matrices overlaying each other in terms of planetary movement and chakra development. And uh, it's, very, it's very complex. And they each offer, depending on which you're the most drawn to study, they each offer a doorway in. You don't need to know it all, but you kind of have to focus in on one and it will be your doorway in is kind of how I think about it. Yeah, it's very interesting. That makes sense. And because a lot of these systems are just mirrors of each other with different metaphors being used. So if you start to understand that there's going to be a correlation across all these different systems and that meridians are talking about the physical aspect of the chakras, for example, that there's crossover there, it can be really helpful because then when you start to branch out to other paths after you feel like you've made progress in the one that you were drawn to, you'll start, you'll just get it more quickly. But I wanted to talk about some of the tools and techniques that you teach for chakra empowerment. Uh, what, what kind of things do you do with yourself and maybe talk about how the book is going to instruct somebody and the, how that book is structured? Because I, I was looking through the table of contents. It looks like looks like a field manual <laughs> more than yeah. a, than a book like it, you know the user's guide for the technology of the human body that you never got yeah you know really that is i think that is how i tend to think and it is it's like a tech book it, it's it's meant to be accessible but it is like how do you use your chakras and it's got 12 tools in it so the first seven are one of the, each the seven chakras and then the other five tools are multi chakra tools but one of the things i'm trying to do in the book is help people think about their chakras almost like muscles in their body. You can bring forth an energy you need when you need it. It's always available to you. You just have to train a little bit in how to do so. So we talk about the root chakra being about grounding, stabilizing. We talk about the navel chakra, for example, being rooted to uh, your sense of self, your sense of confidence and identity. 
So you're going into a situation that is nerve wracking and you're finding your mind is spinning and you're feeling anxious. You need some root chakra energy. You need some navel chakra energy. You can write in the moment if you're, once you've trained yourself able to do so, bring that like almost release an influx of that energy in your body through your chakras. And that's what I'm, that's one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is really help people uh, train. So I, I develop these activation processes and they're just ways of drawing upon memory and visual and uh, affirmations to kind of train yourself in what it really feels like to flood your body with a certain chakra energy. And then you can do it in the moment when you need that energy. So it's almost medicinal, <laughs> like, oh, I need some heart chakra energy right now. I need some third eye energy right now. And this is part of chakra teachings. It isn't one of the more emphasized ways of using them. But I think in this day and age where we're really all overwhelmed a lot of the time, it's extremely valuable. So that's kind of one aspect of the book. And then within that, I go into women's and subtle body differences with the cycles and phases of life and all that. And then sexual trauma healing as well, because right now that is such an important theme in particular. Yeah, I want to return to that theme for a good portion of the show, no doubt. But I'm really interested in how once you create this scaffolding for strengthening or using the energy of a certain part of yourself, that you can tap into it more easily. Because I like to say energy is just an idea because everything is just an idea. <laughs> and for example, if you were convinced if I somehow could convince you that you were going to get $20 million tomorrow morning when you woke up, but you'd have to go to sleep by 10 PM and stay, not wake up all night until the morning, you know, you'd be like a five-year-old on Christmas. It would, you'd be so excited. <laughs> I mean, money is not a good thing to be excited about overall, but we all, we all want to win the lottery, right? So no one was, no one would not be stoked about that because it represents freedom and energy, but you the same by the same token, if you realize that all you have to do to have energy is have the right idea, then that's the best idea you could have. <laughs> and I, one thing that I like to do to b draw on or strengthen certain chakras is just do an intonation. And sometimes I have to just like kind of move my voice around till I find the sweet spot. But uh, that's not really something you can do in a crowd without at least drawing some funny looks <laughs> or at work in the, at the office or you know, not all your trigger moments are socially accepting <laughs> type right, of places right. to start making sounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you have some ways that you describe in the book to actually tap in without needing to do anything very drastic at all. Yeah. Well, and you can even use your approach, but you have to train yourself to actually click in your whole body. What does it feel like? So if you're using a certain intonation, a certain chant, whatever it is. In my case in the book, because I, I can't put sound in the book, I'm using visuals and affirmations and your own memory. Uh, if you get to this place where you're like, oh, okay, I've really got my navel chakra fired up right now. And then really tune into what that feels like vibration wise in your body. And you, you, have an, you have an energetic memory. We're not trained to use it. But if you tap into that energetic memory, and it's almost like you take a snapshot picture of it. And you can train yourself to be able to just go there like that. It does take practice. It doesn't happen overnight. So in other words, you could mi migrate from the approach you're currently using to not needing to make the sound by really tuning into the feeling in your body once the intonation has worked for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's great advice. That's a great next step. And you can even you can even do the intonation internally, like in your head. That's also possible. <laughs> or uh, what you know, you can find your personal mantra, create a personal mantra. I always recommend that one. And yeah, overall, this this is pretty cool stuff. Uh, I really like how the quick and dirty of daily life situations can be confronted with you know your own infinite potential instead of feeling limited. If you have this realization that all that you are all the energy in the whole cosmos. But when it comes to understanding your own blockages, like for myself, I didn't really put two and two together about some of the solar plexus issues I was having, even though there was symbolic clues in my life and dreams and everything for a long time. 
how can a person measure the health or strength of their own chakras and know where to start for getting into better balance? Yeah, well, it does usually reflect in your life. And sometimes it reflects in you know, where you do experience health issues, right? Like typically, if someone has a lot of digestive issues, that is mapped to solar plexus or navel chakra issues, right? So it all depends. Or it, it, You had tightness in your chest, that ties to solar plexus or heart. So sometimes your physical body is giving, your clue, giving you clues. Each chakra is linked to different psyche functions. So if you have a hard time staying grounded, if you're often... Uh, spacing out or have difficult manifesting money that's linked to potential root chakra obstructions. If you have trouble speaking up, that's throat chakra, or it can go the other way. You talk nonstop, but you never really connect with people. That's a way of using speech as a wall. That's also a throat chakra imbalance. So there's really, it's a matter of learning about and I, and I try to address that in the book too, but there, there's a lot of people that write well about this as well, the different psychological functions and you look at your life and what is happening, like what, what walls are you running up against over and over? Is it in relationship? Is it in relation to money? Is it in relation to health? Um, and you can look at those patterns and start looking at, well, what is that? What is that representing in my own chakra system, in my own body? I have to be careful when I say things like that, because I really don't like any teachings that kind of can slip in to blame the victim, right? Like everything that's happening to you. I, I actually don't, I'm not completely comfortable with everything is happening to you is coming from the inside because I think karma is much more complicated than that. It's always an interaction between what is coming out of us and how that's bumping into what's coming out of everybody else. <laughs> um, and so it's never quite so straightforward that you're just creating your own reality. You're in a co-creation situation with everyone around you and everyone in your life, but you can certainly look at what's happening and it gives you a lot of insight into which chakras you might want to focus more on and what, is strong for you as well. What areas you may be gifted in, right? Like to me, you are throat chakra gifted, right? With your, your amazing introductions in your way with words and things like that, right? So we also get insight into where we have a lot of light coming through naturally already. Very cool. I like how you managed to point out that whenever there is something going out of whack, off kilter with a certain part of your self-expression that it tends to be on the repressive or reactive side of a spectrum so you you have two different ways of possibly going wrong like the chakras can be overactive or underactive is another way of looking at it yeah. so any time that you feel like you're now repressive is like meaning that you are doing the oppressing to yourself so that's another thing to realize about when you do feel like repressed in your ability to speech you find yourself kind of stumbling over words more than you should. There's also, you know, potentially physical uh, connections to stuff like that, too, though. Like, are you getting the right nutrient blend? Do you have enough vitamin B if you're not a meat eater? Stuff like that can actually yeah. affect your chakra health as well in the sense that you won't communicate as readily or easily or you won't have as much energy to just get around and do stuff or you won't have a libido. and so. Like we started off talking about, there's two ways to approach all of these symptomatic things. And none of the ways to approach them healthily involve going to the guys in white coats and getting a prescription for psychiatric medicines. And if that's where you've been led to, it's hopefully empowering to know that it's not where you have to stay. Yeah, I mean, I especially working with trauma uh, survivors, I do have a lot of clients who at one point or another have found medication helpful or have tried it and not found it helpful. <laughs> but in the case of those who have found it helpful, it's very encouraging that most don't want to be on it lifelong, right? So it's encouraging to think, okay, this is something that may help me as I'm working through what's going on on the, all of these other levels. And then I may be able to move off the medication it can sometimes be a needed, you know, crutch, or I shouldn't say crutch, what would be the right word? A needed helper. Uh, and of course, sometimes it's, it can unfortunately be very damaging because our medical system doesn't know how to measure a lot of things, right? It's, it's pretty um, basic, I guess you could say. Yeah. But I like what you're saying about repression. I think with any, any chakra, it's like we can have 
things that are wounds, like it's a wound that's, that's almost like that chakra is damaged and needs to be healed, or we can be self-protecting it. And that happens a lot with the heart. We can be guarding, it happens with all the chakras, but the heart in particular, we can have put our own limitation on it out of some fear, out of some self-protection that is rooted in some other fear that has to be dealt with. So it, it can get complex in terms of why uh, the energy is not moving through a particular chakra in the brightest way that it could. Uh, one researcher from earlier in the 20th century that I really like on this topic is Wilhelm Reich. Yes. And he would say that even things like excess fat on the body or over over musculature constriction and like a ha super hard body, if you will, can both be types of armoring that the person does because uh, of whatever is going on in the psyche that is self-repressing. So yeah, that it's important to know that the, the armoring that we put on our feelings and feelings are important because that's how you actually know what's going on around you. <laughs> the yeah. armoring we put on those are, is uh, sometimes in ways that we think is like the, actually something good for us. Like uh, somebody that is, I mean, not that you shouldn't exercise. Exercise is great, but there's a level of that where you actually start doing damage to the body and then not recouping that damage. Cause you just keep doing it and just keep, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. And you think that you're doing that because you have like a need uh, to, uh, you know, counter some weakness or something. I mean, there's all kinds of psychological reasons why you might get there, but even, even that, which appears on the exterior to be like a, a health positive trait can actually be a form of armoring and masking your inner situation. Yeah. And one common trend that kind of relates to that, that I have seen go that direction is detoxing and cleansing, right? Which of course can be a very helpful thing for someone on the physical level for detoxing your system and all this sort of thing. But I will run into clients who are overusing it and it's almost become a form of self-punishment, right? Or uh, it almost becomes eating disorder like in the sense of it's become linked to control, right? Their psyche needs to feel this sense of control or this sense of trying to get more and more and more pure and they never feel pure enough. Right. And then at that point it has actually tipped over into something that's not healthy because of their psychological relationship to it. So yeah, you never really can tell from the outside. It's really is from the inside, your relationship to something, whether it's healthy for you or not. Um, and, and this is kind of tangential, but I wanted to jump back to foods and chakras because there is, some people doing some amazing work uh, in that area. Two of my favorites are Becca Chopra and Deanna uh, Minich, both who have books out on the chakra energy diet and all that, and which foods help bring forth the energies of a particular chakra, which activate it, which stabilize it. it it's all really interesting stuff. It's a whole nother way of eating. That's cool. That's another level. I always just thought we'll go by the color of the food and that's probably a good guideline, but that's part of it. There's yeah. more than one way it could affect that center. You're right. It could be soothing. It could be energizing. There's a whole range of dynamics. So that sounds like really cool and important research. I will have to check into that. That's uh, yeah. new, new to it me. Is. It is cool. Well, while we're on the subject of trauma a little bit, I mean, we've been floating around it. Let's talk about how chakra empowerment for women is going to utilize tools for healing sexual trauma in energy work. Like, what are some of the benefits that you're seeking to create for readers of the book? Yeah, well, I think when it comes to sexual trauma, well, any trauma and really any anything anyone is is dealing with. It's individual for someone what is going to work for them, right? And for some people, traditional talk therapy is very helpful. For others, it's helpful for a time. And then they feel as if they, under, they have come to understand all of their trauma triggers and why they have them, but they're still having them, right? It hasn't taken the next step for them in terms of how do I deal with it in the moment when... I'm feeling triggered, even though I've been through all this counseling and I know why it's happening, right? So they need to get into their bodies. And that's what holistic work does, right? And for who, for the people who it resonates for, working at the subtle body level can be very powerful 
because it helps you really feel in your body what's happening on the physical and energy body level when I'm feeling triggered, where am I constricting, and we're working to release that. When I'm work- In the book, what I'm trying to do is I'm really trying to lay out, here's what I tend to see, especially in sexual trauma survivors. And I think for all trauma survivors, one of the main things that you tend to see is a tendency or patterns of disassociation. So this is just one of many kind of high level, general energy patterns that you might see in someone, especially that experienced a lot of trauma in their childhood, and especially if they experienced sexual trauma in their childhood, is a disconnection from the lower chakras, a discomfort with anchoring in the lower chakras, and in many cases, being really comfortable in the upper chakras. So someone might be really intuitive, really have a very open third eye, but have a lot of time integrating with the lower chakras. And so uh, difficulty staying grounded, for example, in life. Um, and, And so in the book, I'm addressing how, if you feel you have that pattern, how you might work with your chakras, which exercises you might work with for a period of time to try to help integrate your lower and upper chakras and get more comfortable with your lower chakras. One of the other big ones is releasing shame, which we hold in different places in our body, but we usually hold in our second chakra. That's for both men and women. And working with bringing more light through your second chakra can help release patterns of guilt and shame, self-blame. I think another one, and almost swings to the other end of the spectrum, is when we're talking about this armor, is trauma survivors who over-rely on their navel chakra and willpower It's like, I'm never going to be vulnerable again. So they sort of become very hyper-focused on their navel chakra. From the outside, they seem invincible. But in fact, they're really exhausting themselves because they're just always pushing, pushing, pushing. And there's not really any connection with the first and second chakras to be receiving energy. And they're just self-generating all of it and kind of becoming this powerful island. So, uh, so I don't know, I'm jumping around a bit, but that's like three different examples of how trauma might impact the subtle body. And then in the book, I'm trying to offer how, what could you do to help rebalance and address those patterns? <laughs> very important, very important because our society basically traumatizes people in a few different ways, guaranteed. I mean, just the relationship children and adults tend to have and the disconnect and disassociation and, you know, literally being raised by other people most of the time in, you know, government schools and all that. It's that itself is like a form of abandonment trauma. But what I find really interesting in this dynamic that you were talking about is the shame part of it and shame and the uh, second chakra, how those connect, because a lot of sexual trauma survivors or victims, I don't know the experiencers, I don't know what the best word is. Yeah, they, I know. I just go with survivors, but it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which word to use. <laughs> but a common experience for them is to feel shame for it, like they're responsible for it, even when they were like such a young child that it doesn't even make sense. And, you know, I don't what I don't like to blame the victim thing either. Although I do like the realization that no matter what happens to you, it's something you were ready for and you are actually here to help with that situation in the entire fractal if it happened to you. <laughs> but but with shame, there's like this shame versus guilt thing, at least in my mind, where there's an element of shame that actually has a positive root, like just like there's a dark part of uh, every cycle or like how there's a, a hormone swing in the balance of the feminine cycle that might make them seem more quote unquote negative, but it could also be looked at as realistic. I think shame can be a similar thing where if there is behavior that is legitimately morally inferior that has happened, the fact that you felt a shame for it is like supposed to be your catalyst, but it's not supposed to be, it's like a fuel, but it's not supposed to be something that you never use. You need to burn the fuel to actually get the lift out of it. So You know, we don't want to like hang around in shame. And we also want to recognize that guilt typically isn't is coming from like the the society, the voice in your head that you have installed. That's the voice of other people, what they might think. And that needs to be uninstalled. (laughs) But there's so your shame is something like don't 
because you don't want to go fully shameless as far as your way of approaching society and the world. Like there are certain things that if you did to other people, it would be kind of shameful. So I just like to point that out because there's occasionally, I'm not saying that this is you, but there's occasionally elements in what you would call the, the new age or spiritual teachings of these times that actually seeks, in my opinion, to like liberate the person, the person's ego from shame entirely. And then that puts them on a whole different destructive trip. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it can become narcissistic, right? Yeah. Where it's just like, I can do whatever I want. There's no, there's no, that I can do whatever I want. There's no, uh, complications or the or dark com- side of realizing you create your own reality is going into like megalomaniac mode for sure. <laughs> no. So I agree with you. And when, when it comes to our own actions, it is, if we make a mistake, it is very important. Well, shame is what helps us realize we made a mistake. Right. And then, yeah, you have to work through it and change. Right. And so it is a signal and a trigger and it's in a way, the seed of compassion in that circumstance. Yeah. And the shame I'm really speaking to is the way someone who's blamed, who was you know, not responsible, a child who was sexually abused by their uncle. And then what often what sexual chronic sexual abusers do is they actually do manipulate their victims to believe it's their fault. The abuse is occurring. And if someone carries that around, they go into their life essentially feeling they are bad and unworthy of being treated any other way. And that creates this whole ongoing pattern of being in abusive relationships or abusive situations. And that sent that kind of shame needs to be healed. It was always a delusion. It's wrapped up with these feelings of unworthiness and blocking your own light, right? And, and it needs to be released. So I think there are two different kinds of shame. You're absolutely right. I'm so glad you said all that. There was the best part of the entire show so far, because okay. I think <laughs> it's so important. I know personally people that experience this dynamic and still struggle to see why they think that they're not good enough or why they like and it goes back to almost like the over athleticism hard body thing where yeah. um they have people will get the idea sometimes that the only way they can be good enough is if they're that mentally hard on themselves and tell themselves that they're shitty yeah so it's like they're they're like creating they realize that the shame can be a fuel, but they just keep shaming themselves instead of just using it once and getting, uh, you know, like gliding without the need to continue having yeah. shitty shame all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, they're like kind of self-medicating the shame with these temporary highs that working out or feeling strong gives them. But then you're caught on that. You're caught on that seesaw because one day you feel great and then the next day you don't look as good or you didn't lift as much or whatever. And then you feel like shit again. You're just caught on the same seesaw. Right. And the same thing, at least to stuff like eating disorders, too, especially yeah. for females, but even men. Yeah, it's that whole control cycle and trying to make yourself feel better instead of working to heal that underlying womb, wound of unworthiness in the first place. So can you give us any like tips on releasing shame ourselves uh just a like a quick hack (laughs) yeah well so i think just it, it takes noticing first and acknowledging that you have some moment where you feel insecure or unworthy and you don't even have to go for the big enchilada you don't have to be like what's the root of all my unworthiness and shame you can just notice like take a memory from the last two days in which something triggered inside you where something you heard, something someone else said, some situation, you realized you felt insecure or unsure of yourself. And you can just work even with that very little piece of insecurity, right? Or feeling unworthiness and feel, where do I feel it in my body? Go into that memory. Where do I feel it in my body? Now, there's a lot of different directions you can go with it. But what I like to do is just really imagine then that energy coming out and it's like a little baby and you are its mother or father and you're just sending it unconditional love. Or you can do it right in that spot in your body. I'm just going to send this part of me that feels unworthy, insecure, uh, ashamed, whatever it is. I'm just going to send it absolutely unconditional love in this moment. Sounds very cliche, I know, but something like that in the moment can be very transforming. And if you repeat it enough, it begins to loosen the hold of that pattern. It begins to liberate that pattern within your subtle body and eventually within your emotional body and mind. I uh, totally get the dynamic. It's actually, it came up on a couple episodes back with 
these uh, guys that made a documentary about PTSD veterans that were going through healing processes in a different route. But the the idea that there's like these demons that we keep inside of ourselves and what actually gives them the power over us and the ability to whisper in our ear is the fact that we're keeping them in the cage and we're like the warden of their jail. And I like that you were describing calling this stuck energy of like picturing it as if it's a baby that you're going to care for. Cause now I'm going to call it demon babies. <laughs> Do you have these? You know, what's so interesting that you use the word demon. You have these little demon babies inside and it's really just demon means etymologically, it means like divided man. It's the, yeah. it's just your consciousness divided into a compartmentalized section. And just yeah. like the energy being stuck in the body that we've been talking about this whole time, wherever it's held in like your musculature, however, the tension is held and just stays there. And you think that that's baseline, but you're actually tense. That yeah. energy takes a form. And energy takes the form of its container. Like it's like water in that sense. So would you agree that like based on where it's stuck in the body, you can figure or based on the type of feeling that you're having, you can kind of get a clue where it might be in your body if you're not making that connection. Because I know I know people who've gone through this type of sort of therapy and still had trouble finding the body connection to the feeling of like it not good enough and stuff like that. And they think it's kind of all in their head. And I wondered if there's like um, ways to map that on the intellectual level. You know, it is for some people very challenging and I will go out on a limb, a little bit of a limb, not a huge limb, but just based on my own client work. It's often men have a harder time initially connecting to where do I feel an emotion in my body? I find that most women do uh, make that connection sooner. And that has a lot to do with conditioning when we're younger in terms of the messages that we receive about our emotions, right? Our culture is still very gendered around boys emotions being shut down and girls emotions being allowed and so that's a, that's a huge problem so i think i don't know to me it just takes practice and i uh you can use the chakra mappings and if you if you're not feeling shame anywhere then go down low in your pelvis and assume that shame is is down there if you're not feeling an emotional hurt you can just go to your hot chakra area and imagine that there is a um a black or a dark uh, demon baby there <laughs> and work with it there. Even if you're not feeling it there, you can use the chakra mappings as a way of locating different things. Um, but my, my mind's sort of exploding in different directions because you use the word demon. And I, and I love that you brought up the etymology of that because in my own personal spiritual practice, I study in a lineage with a woman named Lama Sultramalioni, who is a Western teacher. She's American, but she's a Tibetan Buddhist Lama. And um, one of the practices that she's developed is called Feeding Your Demons. And it's based on the Tibetan shamanic practice of Chud. And it is all about instead of fighting your demons, feed them, right? That it's this whole idea of exactly what you just said, that all of these obstructions that we come to see as demons, as objectify, we sort of objectify outside of ourselves as being the evils of the world, and, or within ourselves, the problems with ourselves that we have to fix. We're so used to fixing things, fighting things. And instead, if we approach them with acceptance as if they're wounded and hurt and feed them, <laughs> feed them, essentially, <laughs> like a mother would feed her child, uh, it's a whole different dynamic and it's a whole different way of relating to your own obstructions and the darkness in the world for that matter. Yeah, and it's a tidy metaphor for the fractality of life because one of the very first traumas that a person might experience in their life is maybe being in a crib and their parents are out of the room and crying for them for a long time and they don't come in. Like lots of people probably have that somewhere in there and it's not that big of a deal to the on the parent side. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but to the child they just don't know better and so they're they're experiencing that as a trauma or as a you know, separation, anxiety, abandonment thing. And so the demon baby is kind of the same way. You've like shoved it into, it's something you created. So it's your child in that sense. And you've kind of pushed it away into the dark closet of your mind and swept it under the bed and said, you'll deal with it later. <laughs> one thing that like to continue that metaphor, extend it uh, one wild way that you can actually start to get some chakra empowerment, energetic uplift, at least that I experience is by reimagining, reforging, reorganizing, decluttering your personal space as the place that you live is a reflection of your psyche in a fractal sense too. 
Oh, well, I couldn't agree more. You know, again, that whole outer is inner thing. And sometimes when, when you're working externally, it makes a huge difference. And actually with the chakras, a lot of people, I don't do this so much, but a lot of people do this with color, right? That if you're trying to bring forth, say the root chakra, which is linked to red in most systems, that you surround yourself or even wear red for a few days, right? So you can work with color, you can work with different um, yantras and geograph ge geometric shapes, and all of those things on a deep psychic level will help bring forth different energies within you as well. Yeah. And like I said earlier, there's weird reflections in your personal life. I have this selenite wand that has chakra stones on the handle, like seven yeah. colors. And the damn yellow stone kept falling off for like two years. <laughs> Just that one. Yeah. The solar plexus one. So it's funny. There's there's always the it clues. It was trying to give you the message. It was trying to give you the message. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I even got the message, but it just took me a long time to actually unpack it, understand it as simple as it is. But it's a continual thing. Like balancing isn't a one time thing. And that's it. You're balanced. That's an important thing to realize. No, I agree. We talk a lot about chakra opening and chakra balancing, but I feel like that there are these different levels. So you can balance your chakras on a particular day. You're out in nature and you feel everything is very balanced and clear. But obviously that doesn't mean in that one moment that you cleared all the obstructions at every level. You've achieved on that day a certain balance point at a certain level. And that's helpful and meaningful. And it's a good skill to have. But what the kind of work we're talking about is on the second and third, the deeper levels of the chakras that really have to do with your karmic body um, and your whole emotional conditioning linked to your psyche, your subconscious, all of that. And getting down to that level, you're circling through it over and over on a deeper and deeper level. And to some extent, perhaps even, you know, it, you're doing it within the context of the world. So sometimes you're also processing for the world some of the obstructions that are going on. It's kind of what's going on with the Me Too movement right now, right? It's a mass uplifting that's happening in people, individuals as well. It's playing through individuals, but it's actually more about an energetic shift that's happening at a larger level. Some of it is swinging too far. We're trying to find our balance. We're trying to figure it out on the cultural level. What does it mean? It's, it's both inner and outer at the same time. Yeah, that'd be fun to return to. But I wanted to give you a little bit of space here at the end of the free hour to just let everyone know how the tools in Chakra Empowerment for Women are unique. And, you know, uh, give, give us a little more information that you'd like to let them know about the book. You'll have time again at the end to talk about where people can find you. But I just wanted to make sure that anything else you wanted said to the free crowd, we could tell them about your upcoming uh, <laughs> achievement of uh, authorship. Great. Yeah. Well, so Chakra Empowerment for Women, it is out through Llewellyn Publishing and you can publish through them. You can get it through them or Amazon and other places or get your own local independent bookstore even better to order it <laughs> if you don't want to feed the Amazon uh, monster. And I think what's unique about it is this focus on the feminine energy body and the life phases, uh, how our energy body shifts during each of these different life phases, including how to use your menstrual cycle energetically, all of that kind of stuff menopause, pregnancy, and the sexual trauma healing angle. And then the active chakra activation angle and the, the ability, develop the ability to bring forth the chakra energy that you need on the spot in your life. We are so overwhelmed with energies as the population of this planet gets bigger and bigger and denser and denser that it becomes harder and harder to feel and control the vibration of your own energy body. And so that's, that's really part of what these tools are meant to address is your ability to really tune in a way your own energy body throughout your daily life. Brilliant. Yeah. And guys, just because this is a geared towards a females book, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but if they got this for like their spouse or their mom or whoever, they could probably borrow it and still read the tips on chakra uh, practices. I'm sure they're going to apply to both genders in some cases. You're right. Most, a lot of it does. And I really struggled with that, but because I wanted to put in the women's energetics and uh, info, I ended up targeting the book towards women. But in fact, you're right. The, the majority of the activation work at each chakra level applies to both. So maybe some point in the future, I'll do the, the tweaked version for men, like I said. <laughs> yeah, very awesome. 
Uh, well, how could someone reach you and learn more about the book and your work? Remind everybody where you like to receive communication and what social media you do. And also, if you got any closing thoughts or threads you want to tie up, um, we're all ears. This has been a blast. We're so glad. I say we because I know people who just listened to this episode are very glad they just did. And uh, I know I, <laughs> I, hope so. I loved this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Chance. It's been great. I really appreciate you having me on. Um, yeah, the book website is chakraempowermentforwomen.com. The client website is enlightenedenergetics.com. <laughs> my blog, my longstanding blog is Mommy Mystic, although uh, no, none of my kids call me mommy anymore, so it was born a long time ago. <laughs> um, and on um, social media, Instagram, it's Chakra Empowerment. Facebook, it's Chakra Empowerment. Uh, so that's how you find me. Final thoughts. I think just be who you are. That's always the simplest. Honor who you are. Uh, love is never the wrong choice. So in any moment, if you don't know what to do, choose love. I think those are the simple ones. That's the, that's how I'll go out. Yeah, the simple truths are the strongest, man. All the, yes. the big picture is made up of all the little things. So that's important to remember about whatever part of your journey you're in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. It's been a blast. Everyone go check out Lisa online and pre-order the new book. And uh, thanks for being here. Great. Thank you, Chance. Well, that was another extremely beautiful episode. Thank you so much, Lisa, for coming on the show, talking about your new book. I love the entire concept of the energy body and all the things we spiraled out to around that. And uh, it's something I've really been fascinated in for a long time, probably several years. I'm actually in the middle of slowly getting through a book called, I think it's called Energy Healing or something like that. It's about the science of it. And it's from an acupuncture practitioner who realized that they had some more metaphysical connection to their patients and some Reiki-like abilities coming through the acupuncture. But one interesting story that stuck out to me in there was that when working on somebody who had like a phantom limb type of pain, you know, whenever there's an amputation and that person experiences some kind of like discomfort or itchiness or sensation from what's supposed to be a completely non-existent limb. And, you know, that part of the nervous system is firing somehow, like it's getting some sort of, I don't know, signal. And what this practitioner did of acupuncture was she actually pierced the air in the area around where the limb was. And she essentially targeted what would be the acupuncture points on that person's limb where there wasn't a limb. So the result was very bizarre. It actually cured the guy's phantom limb symptoms. And that, in my opinion, is an interesting anecdotal case to be made for how the energy body is really like a scaffolding or a blueprint that the body, the physical body grows on. And there's some people I've heard talk about. So this is like a little bit of podcast bro science because I couldn't I couldn't find the research in a brief Google search just now. But I remember maybe reading about it in this book or hearing about it on some other show that I like to listen to Mysterious Universe or the Higher Side Chats, who knows? Uh, there's this story that's sticking in my head about Curlian photography and tadpoles and frogs. And maybe someone else out there has heard this and can link me to whatever the heck I'm referencing if you know about it. But Curlian photography is this idea that uh, it's been around for a long time. It's a type of photography using some strange like electric setup that I'm really not sure about. I should research it more before I tell you about it. But essentially, it creates a type of photograph that shows like an, what appears to be like an energy field or an aura around the object, like an illuminated, colorful field. And I know critics or debunkers of it will say that it's some sort of like coronal discharge having to do with atmospheric water or water in the object or They'll say that because you can create sort of a curly in effect on non-organic objects, that it's definitely not life force that you're seeing. But where the tadpoles come in is that supposedly somebody once did this type of photography on tadpoles and was able to make out like the body shape of a frog in the field in the photos. 
And as if the, there was like already the shape of a frog in the metaphysical level that the tadpole was on its way to grow into. So I don't know, take all that how you will, because I couldn't find a reference to it. But it's a really interesting idea nonetheless. And I think in my personal life, there's plenty of evidence that there is an energy body. There is a subtle field that we all are connected through and that we have a lot more power over <laughs> things in our internal field and in our energy than we realize. It's just a matter of awareness being like the key towards transmuting things into what we want or remove, not removing, but like feeling through and getting the bad things out of our field instead of having them be stuck there, the harmful things, right? And trauma has a lot to do with that. And that's why I think the work that Lisa does and people like her are really important because getting more internal awareness and even if you just look at the chakras as a metaphor for different types of emotion and feelings that you could have in different parts of your body, it's still really useful whether you look at it as real metaphysical energy vortex centers or not. Very useful. I mean, it's been nothing but interesting to me uh, since I heard about this concept years ago, gradually and slowly understanding the difference between these parts of my being has given me a lot more agency over <laughs> my vibe, I guess. I don't know. Like, here's a silly anecdote. It's just, this is going to be me half bragging, half uh, revealing like a embarrassing story. But the other night I woke up, I guess it was the morning, like an hour before I would normally wake up and I got up to go to the bathroom and I slammed my shin onto an open drawer that was, you know, because I have a bad habit of not mindfully leaving drawers open and cabinets open instead of closing them all the way. And I ran my shin into this and scraped this huge bloody gash all across my shin. You know how thin the skin shin, the shin skin <laughs> is. It's pretty gnarly if you slam it into stuff. And so I had this big bleeding bloody gash and I just went to the bathroom and then bandaged up the wound and went back to sleep and was asleep within moments after cleaning that up. And I was kind of stoked on it. Not that I got hurt, but that there I received information like a, a lesson about myself, which was that I should pay more attention to like closing things and finishing what I started instead of leaving stuff half finished all the time. And uh, the upside was that I didn't get pissed off or have a really negative visceral reaction. Like I had no internal bad reaction to what happened to my leg. It was just like, oh, well, now I need to bandage this. That's just what is going on right now. And it was super neutral. And But then there's the positive element of kind of realizing why it happened and having a lot, a really good memory and anchor point through, I guess, trauma, but not like this isn't stuck trauma, right? The trauma is teaching me something I needed to pay more attention to. So kind of useful. But anyway, I guess I should tell you guys about the plus extension. I've been going on for a bit. I reminded you about Plus at the beginning of the show, but I'll tell you again now, you can subscribe to Interverse Plus for $5 a month and you get a double long version of almost every episode, unless there's some reason why I can't get a Plus extension. But there's at least 70 or more episodes out there now in the archive that have got a great second hour where things get much more interesting because we're so much more warmed up. And... It's kind of a lot to uh, make a weekly podcast. I don't always get a weekly one out, but that's the goal. So you're getting three to five two-hour podcasts a month. It's a great deal for $5. I mean, that's like what? One Starbucks drink that you probably could have, you know, gone without. <laughs> not that I'm not guilty of uh, frivolous spending, especially on snacks. It's probably like my biggest financial drain point. So maybe that's why I'm judging you about it now. So sorry, I won't come at you like that. But seriously, I do need your support because I want to make this my regular job or whatever, instead of having to have other jobs so much. And then I could do, definitely do a show a week without as much trouble. So you help me, I help you by getting better and better guests. Also, you can always let me know what guests you'd like to have appear on the show by sending me an email at chance at interversepodcast.com. So yeah, anyway, plus patreon.com forward slash interverse. Today we talked about the problem of gender health education segregation, which is a huge problem. I mean, I barely even, as I said in that part 
I really didn't even know much about the female reproductive system coming out of public school, like basically nothing. And we talked about the pros and cons of modern feminism and the lingering gender role stigmas, the impact of relationships and families on our spiritual path, positive and negative, how motherhood changes the energy body of women, and just a little bit more about how the energy body of a female changes over the course of their life. Channeling second chakra sexual energy into a creative container. That is something that I think definitely applies to men and women. Maybe even more of a sort of important thing for men to pick up on overall because maybe men get more focused on sex. Like that could be just a stereotype. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I don't know. But anyway, that is a really great topic for the show's overall theme of creativity and wanting to embrace our artistic vocations. So that conversation about how to channel that second chakra sexual attraction into magnetizing your creations into the world from your imagination, pretty cool stuff. And we got into the origins and initial purpose of tantric Buddhism and healthy sexual perspectives, the aging and effect on our spiritual energy of our, <laughs> sorry, the effect of aging And how our spiritual energy influences our bodies over the long term. And the sneaky self-repression embedded in the law of attraction ideology. That was a cool little tangent we went on. I love talking about law of attraction and like what is and isn't working about that as a sort of new age. uh, Kind of a cult, a little bit of a cult, not a massive cult, but a lot of things are cults. Got to be real about it. And we talked about retrograde planets in one's natal chart. So that could be useful if you are someone that's got those. And finally, Lisa gave some recommendations to experienced energy workers as opposed to like newbie recommendations of things to check out or look into. So that's pretty cool. I know our plus tribe is definitely comprised of a lot of energy workers, whether they work on their own energy or other people's. I think we all kind of need to take up that mantle of learning to perceive where the blockages in ourselves correspond to the blockages in our life or in other people and doing that self-healing work to bring about that same exact change and transformation in the collective and in the world because that's really the only way it works. So anyway, I hope you guys get on to plus because I want more people to listen to that really good content in this episode and all the others. Got several cool things coming up already recorded. Excited to share with you guys. It's going to be a fantastic last month of the year for Interverse. So thanks for being here with me. And remember, if this is your first time checking out the show, wherever you're hearing it from, you can subscribe on iTunes podcast app, Google Play, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, all kinds of places beyond that, actually. Just, you know, Go to interversepodcast.com, find your favorite place that you'd like to listen to podcasts or subscribe to it on all of them or leave a five-star review on the iTunes podcast app if you are so inclined. That's very helpful. And of course, it's wonderful if you share this podcast with people that you care about that you know like this type of consciousness exploration, exciting stuff. So thanks. Energy work is a great topic. This was a great episode. Glad you're here. Thanks again, Lisa, and I will talk to you all real soon. Bye-bye.